they are more complicated. It well, feels like they seem to be not just a little bit longer, but exponentially longer. Maybe it's right? computer technology. Yeah. I mean, no, it's, it that's really not. isn't. It's okay. a, the need from the government. And one of the things that we found is when the 117 was in, you know, we went from uh, build, we went from start of design to the first flight in four years on the 117. And that was a very, you know, that was a typical skunk works type of program where you have a national need and a motivation by the government and the contractor to develop a process and capability very quickly. Right now you look at, you know, and we were we were heavily we, we designed the F-22, Y F-22 in Burbank, and the issue really was they didn't want the norm. They, you pay a penalty for a black program, right. and if it's a black program, you can get away, you can eliminate a lot of general standard requirements. You can streamline what you need to do. And one of the things with the 117, it was the introduction of a really primarily the focus was stealth get the signature down, get the capability out, don't tell anybody about it, and develop the capability. B2, on the other hand, was um, we, had, we were bidding, as was Northrop, we came to the, the government came to the conclusion that Boeing, the Northrop folks had a better answer, and as a result, it took longer for them. They had the experience from Task Blue, on the other, mm -hmm. very, very low observable at whale airplane that they had done, and one of the things that they found was that was about a 10 year span, 10 to 12 year span. 117 was a four year, four or five year span. It depends on how much, how badly the government wants the program. The tank program, as you mentioned, you know, they have, they have an asset that works very well for them. They know it's old, they know it needs maintenance, so they want a next generation, but that's gonna be probably 15 years, right. 10 to 15 years out, unfortunately. The turn time now, with the expense, it just drives a lot more. Requirements, uh, if it's a black program, you can do it still very quickly. If it's in the white world, for whatever reason, then it stretches out quite a bit. And that's unfortunate, because a lot of the new hires, new engineers that I have, will probably work on two or three airplanes, whereas I've worked on probably seven in 30 years. My predecessors, my father, worked on probably 15 airplanes in mm -hmm. 30 years. And it's like, okay, the timeline is getting much, much longer, and as you said, exponentially longer, for a more complicated system. So the complication is another fact we're actually right to throw in. Yeah, I expect it to stretch, but it's just like, it seems to be like, yeah, yeah. it's, like it's right exponentially, really? it doesn't, shouldn't yeah. need to stretch that far, and I agree with you, but you have to have a national need. Need yeah. also, and as I said, you pay a pay a pretty stiff penalty to have black all black all black program, and then it'll have to come out eventually. Mm -hmm. That was a good question. Well. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Okay, I work at UPS on the day ramp at DFW Airport. Um, how long did it take to start the engines using the uh, Buick Wildcats? I read somewhere it took about 15 minutes because it was such it was designed to run at supersonic speeds versus subsonic. With the wild, with the Buicks, or they, they call them Buicks, um, when, when I was involved in the program a little bit later they were Chevys. We had two 454 Chevy instead of 455. The 454s and 455s typically would be two motors back to back, and they would spin the shaft, and you'd spin. You'd, you'd have to put about 800, 900 horsepower into the shaft to for it to spin up. It was on a start cart that would raise the shaft up. You'd hit a, a pad on the engine, and you'd spin it. You'd have one start cart on one side, one start cart on the other side or you could try, take it from one to the other. But typically you'd spin that up, as you, did you hear the tape? It was probably about five minutes you could get them running. You'd okay. shoot the tab in there and that would be the flame that would kick in. And then you could get them, but you had to spin the shaft and get that thing spinning and then if you throw the fuel in there and then they'd light up pretty quick. Yeah. Um, the, as I was telling one of, the, one of the visitors, that was an amazing sound. 
you want to, if you want to listen to the horsepower, that was very cool. Typically, when we were running the program in the later phases, they would use an air turbine starter. It was a much more efficient. You know, oh, yeah. you could walk up and twist up an oh, yeah. air turbine, and it would just whoosh, off it go. Um, typically, took about two three minutes to get those spun up. So, with a tab, how did you transport it? You know, to various sites. I tanks. Think. They would tanks. put them in tanks. But as as uh, Jack Vest said, that you get that um, in. In contact with air, it would explode. Right. That's why it just seems so exceptionally it's a, volatile. It's, a, it's an exceptionally volatile uh, chemical. And one of the one of the stories that I heard in, from a previous program, from one of the manufacturing guys, they had a valve that stuck, and the valve on the Teb tank stuck. So they pushed it off to the end of the end of the blast fence. And the, the, this was in Palmdale back in the early 70s, and they couldn't dump the tank. Couldn't get the pressure out of the tank. So I took a hunting rifle out there and blew the valve. <laughs> Bam! That's one way so to do it. That's one way to do it. Yeah, they got, rid, they got rid of the tank. They got rid of the tip problem. They yeah. got rid of the. And it just it was. A, they said it was a pretty loud explosion. It, it irritated some of the local residents, but luckily they were at least three miles away, so they got over it. <laughs> now there were some uh, very interesting times on the on the north side of the Palmdale complex with site two is yes, site two and we would have two run pads behind you chain the engine chain the airplane down and run the engines at full you know whatever power you wanted to check out and verify but they could do full full AB power on the ground and you'd see the shock wave the string of shock waves as you saw in the video yeah. you see these shock shock down the back and it'd go probably 30 40 50 feet back behind the airplane and if you let the engine run off long enough, uh, you can see the actual airplane start to glow heat. But they had some engine stand runs. I think if you look it up on the internet, you look at J58 runs, you can see the engine, you can see the afterburner section of the engine glowing red. And it was like, on the ground, that's true. In the air, you're gonna have some kind of cooling from the air surrounding the airplane. But it was, well, I saw one of the engine, engine stand runs out at Edwards right before we shut down the program. That's very impressive. You want to talk about horsepower? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks cool. So yeah, it does. Uh, it is. It is really a fun airplane to, to watch. It's really a shame that it's not flying now. Yeah, I got to see it fly two times, and that was still on my mind. Even though one, was, like, one of my best day. days at work, working for you know, and I'm getting paid to do this. <laughs> standing at the end of the runway there in Palmdale after we'd refurbished the airplane and having that thing go over my head. I was like, oh man. <laughs> Very gratifying, yeah. excellent team to work with, great people. It really was great people. And a great system. I mean, there was enough history and legacy from the previous program that a lot of people had been involved and helped, and anything they knew they would offer up. And as I said in the meeting, you get to call somebody that's working on something else, and if that's their real passion, that's their real love, hey, I got a job for you. <laughs> Yeah. I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> I did that to about five people, and it was great fun. Oh. I my business card. Then. <laughs> yeah. No, I wasn't. Give me the business card. It's like I want to work. For, I want to work, and that, that's what I did. I called the program manager, said I want to work on your program. He says, "Be over in 20 minutes." And I was there in probably 10. <laughs> I had to walk, for, get up, get across the plant. It's like I'm here. Yeah. He goes, "What are you doing? Get to work." <laughs> it's great. <laughs> oh, the obviously the SR was the, the last of. The vintage. What you know, if other than the kind of forward section of China area, what really changed between the A12 and the SR extension of? Uh, they went from the A12 to the YF12, mm -hmm. and that was supposed to. That was going to be fighter. the intercept, fighter interceptor. <laughs> Still baffles me as far as the concept, but it was a very then. And NASA actually got the airplanes and they flew those as experimentals for a while. Uh, and that was at the Air Force Museum, mm -hmm. one of them. Uh, the M12 was the launcher for the D21. So they had four or five derivative airplanes that they built. And uh, as a result, the, that, the, with the, with the two-seat trainer, they had the M12, which had two seats. Mm -hmm. They had the YF12, which had two seats. And they had the SR-71, because the CIA really was pretty much 
said we want to get out of the airplane business, let the Air Force guys do that. So there was a. Is there any thought ever of the Air Force just you know, bringing the A-12s back, you know, yeah. re-engineering them, or yeah. are they just enough? They learned enough that. They learned really enough and it fed into the, S the SR-71 production line. And the SR-71 production line was running through from about 1964 through about 1974. It was about 10 years that they were actually building three, there were 33 airplanes built. And of the uh, 33, I think 21 of them are still, are in museums now, as, you know, as, mm -hmm. as evidence mm -hmm. there. Um, they had, uh, at one time, there were probably 700 people in Burbank working on that oh, family okay. of airplanes, and that's a lot for yeah. us. Especially you know. to keep it on the. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't very well. I mean, it wasn't very well advertised. Right. I mean, there was the comment that Lyndon Johnson announced the airplane's existence, and that took the, you know, the high expense of keeping black black off the off the table. But as a result, a lot of the folks that had worked on that. And when the in 74, 75, they moved into building Half Blue, mm -hmm. which was the first stealth prototype demonstrator that was a demonstrator, and that ran, that became the, the 117. So a lot of the same team, when I hired in working on 117, actually it, it started on the U2. Some of them had started on P38s. Oh, wow. Some of it worked. Some of them had worked on jet stars back in the 57, 56 time frame. A couple of them had worked on the early C130s. So, I mean, there was a group of people, as we said earlier, a bunch of people that had, you know, moved from this airplane to this airplane to this airplane to this airplane, and they moved from job to job every couple of years. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it should be, but... You, know, it's you, bring, you bring historical data, you know... Historical data, but with you, you, you learn a lot of knowledge. And experience. And you, that didn't work there, will it work here? If right. it didn't work there. The interesting thing that I found, at least about the, the group that I'm working with, is you take a... You know, in the, in the long time history, you took a 104. What was the what was the reason they built the 104? Well, P80 was a good airplane. They wanted something much faster, so you design a Mach 2 airplane. You take that, move that into a U2. Take that. Okay, that's that's pretty well. There was an amazing amount of parts from the U2 that went into the A12. Very high altitude. Very you know the escape system, the ejection seats, that kind of thing went into the uh, A-12, well, that became the family of the other airplanes. Then you start with Hab Blue, with a you took the stealth technology, 